Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will be talking about the work of community foundations with special guests, Nancy Anthony, president of the Oklahoma City Community Foundation, Keith Burrell, president of the Toledo Community Foundation, and Jenny Flynn, president and CEO of the Community Foundation for Southern Arizona. So thank you all for joining us. It's, it's just wonderful uh, to have you here. We're gonna go over to Oklahoma City in a second, but uh, just to set you up, community foundations bring together community resources, the resources of individuals, families, businesses to strengthen communities. And, and the, the objective here is to fund initiatives that those communities need. Sometimes it's a pump priming kind, kind of exercise to create uh, movement around particular issues. So let's start off with you, Nancy, and, and talk about the view from Oklahoma City. Talk about your foundation and the role that you play with other leaders in your communities and with citizens to try and advance the, uh, the civil society of Oklahoma City. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Oklahoma City has a um, a very conservative government, and we really depend on philanthropy and donors and, and to some extent the faith community to provide a lot of services and, and services that might be provided more liberally in other areas by government. We kind of depend on private donors to, to take, take initiative and do that. And so the Community Foundation, as a result of that, has been very engaged in encouraging donors to see that responsibility and to provide support, whether it be through endowment funds or through outright gifts and to su support the not-for-profit community because it is so important for us for just basic social services, for basic, and, and especially recently, we have a lot of, seem to have a lot of disasters around Oklahoma City, whether they're tornadoes or other activities and especially COVID, I think we learned how important it was for our private sector, our, our private organizations to step up and really provide the support that individuals really needed. So for us, philanthropy, the Community Foundation is, is really an encourager of philanthropy. We try to be a leader if we need to be, but more importantly, we want to be a leader in encouraging people to understand how important it is for them to participate. And it's an articulation of the social compact, the American social compact, the idea that citizens are voting with their resources to invest in certain improvements, right? You, you have a lot of ownership given what's going on in Oklahoma City. People are actually discussing these issues because they are underfunded from a government point of view. They're actually stepping in and on a voluntary basis, funding those things that they, they think are really important for the community, right? Uh, definitely, very much so. I think we saw that around the, the COVID response. Inter interestingly enough, someone said, were your contributions down last year? I said, actually, contributions from funds that we had out to the community were way up because people saw the need and really understood that they needed to respond. So I think it's I think it's really important to understand how important the private philanthropy and individual donors are to really, as you say, civil society. Government can't do it all, and nor do we want it to. Well, one of my great joys, uh, Keith, is, is to juxtapose a community like uh, Oklahoma City with a community like Toledo, right? Theoretically, totally different, right? But not really. No, not, not really at all. We, we're dealing with some of the same issues. Um, if you talk about uh, our neighborhoods, at one point in Toledo, we had 16 CDCs. Now we're down basically to zero. Uh, if you talk about our community, we're dealing with homelessness, just like you, you heard about in Oklahoma. And especially important to us, uh, we're the only city our size in Ohio or larger that doesn't have pre-K education. So we're pushing very hard. And in all three cases, that's pushing the marble up the hill. Uh, trying to, you know, I say a lot of our grant granting is risk capital. Let's try things that will work. And then we'll turn to government to say, okay, this worked. Now, can you come behind us and help us sustain it and keep it going? Uh, so a lot of what we have done here in Toledo is around that whole idea. And, and sometimes we, you know, uh, we had a record year last year in the midst of COVID and we try to put our money where our mouths you know, so when we talk philanthropy, we try to do it by supporting organizations, but also creating initiatives that will support that. So when we talk neighborhoods, we took the original Jeep site and in the, it's next to a river 
and it's the floodplain. We put a solar array, 22,000 panels in that floodplain, raised it up so water could still go underneath it. And it's going to throw off uh, approximately 400,000 a year, and that's all around neighborhood work because we need to help wow. figure out how we're going to do CDCs. And as long as the sun keeps shining, they tell us that'll work for 25 years, so we'll see. Um, and it's dedicated. Same thing on uh, pre-K. We figured out, I mean, for those who have looked at this and are far more expert than I am, uh, if we take every uh, four-year-old and put them in a pre-K program, we're going to basically bankrupt a number of our child care uh, providers. So we put money into a shared services concept where they're doing a hub and spoke to do some of the back office work for these daycare systems to keep them in business when we say we need to educate these pre-K kids, these four-year-olds. So, you know, it, it's, it's not much different. It, how do you how do you make push that marble up the hill? And how do we as Americans actually deal with American problems, right? And how do we share knowledge? The, yeah. the, the whole solar uh, deal that you're doing in, in Toledo, manufacturing hub, you know, you have the conversion of the, of the Jeep plant, the glass um, traditions over, over Toledo uh, on the manufacturing side all comes into play. And Jenny, you have also a whole array of, of, of challenges um, also, um, one of the one of the issues that that we have is the whole idea of of serving communities that are geographically dispersed. Right. Could you talk a little bit about um, adding to to the texture of what Nancy and Keith talked about, some of these programs which you have in common, but also this particular issue that you have of trying to to serve an entire region where uh, people are not clustered around one particular metro area? Sure. Yeah, um, we do have a lot of shared challenges and the shared resource um, of a lot of sun. So that's that's nice. Um, we have a very broad area that we serve. It's all of southern Arizona, south of the Gila River, including uh, an affiliate on the uh, U.S.-Mexico border near uh, Nogales called the Santa Cruz Community Foundation. And so, you know, in order to serve this broad uh, swath of, 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 of southern Arizona, um, you know, we, we are, you know, based in Tucson, which is uh, Arizona's second largest city, but we have a really broad rural group as well that, that we serve. So uh, we make sure that we um, provide services that, that the rural um, constituents can, can access. And one of the things, our strategies, a key strategy we have is to really increase the resiliency of the nonprofit sector. So what we find, you know, especially going out to rural communities, but in the metro area as well, is that they're, the people who are there understand the problems of their community, you know, so completely and so thoroughly and, and understand the solutions that have been tried and not worked and the solutions that haven't been tried or what caused it to fail and where they need some assistance to assist them. Respect to local forward. knowledge, right? Yeah, absolutely. Respect local knowledge. Absolutely. So we, we've, we have a couple of strategies towards that end. So one is that we have um, something called the Center for Healthy Nonprofits, which um, provides programming to um we have a CEO roundtable. We have people who are doing, you know, marketing or HR in far flung places and have no colleagues whatsoever in the nonprofit sector. They come together. We provide technical training. Um, for example, we're doing a seven part series on mastering nonprofit finances. We find that's a huge need. Um, HR. So we help with that technical assistance, and those programs are have gone all virtual through um, COVID. Uh, we've partnered with our local universities, University of Arizona and the College of Management to put together nonprofit uh, certificates and nonprofit management and uh, offer those free of charge. We fundraise to, to pay the cost of those. And we've had over 200 individuals go through that program and get certified in the last year. So we're finding there's a big appetite for that. So, so that's uh, one, one strain in which we address this. The other is we, we have a program called core funding, which offers unrestricted support. So we've kind of been making the case to our community and to, to the donors we work with that that local knowledge means that there's also trust there, that people should be able to uh, use the grants that we provide in a way that best meets the needs of their community. And we provide unrestricted funding. And in the last five years, we've gone from about 300000 that we've been able to give away in that core program to about a million. So um, that's what we're up to this year. It's, it's, it's so important. And by the way, um, all attendees, if you have any questions, please uh, please contribute to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Mm -hmm. I'll try and get those questions in. It's so important. These are highly leveraged dollars. When you're talking about investing in training and the infrastructure that's required, 
um, for a successful nonprofit within your ecosystem, every dollar that you're spending is helping a number of different leaders manage their organizations in a better way. Let's talk about some of the uh, problems that we have in common. We've heard homelessness mentioned. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. We've heard education uh, mentioned. I'd like to talk about that. Uh, economic development, and in particular, the idea of using foundations as, as an R&D um, uh, tip of the spear. Um, I love the point that you talked about, uh, Keith, about the solar arrays, because you have a whole new industry uh, that is going to be built up in this country over the next years in that area. So let's st start talking about first homelessness. Could you just, let's go around the table, Nancy. Um, could you just comment on um, housing, homelessness, um, some of these issues that different people are confronting and the, and the way you're, you're experiencing it in Oklahoma City, then we'll go to Keith and then uh, Jenny, and then we'll do the same thing for these, uh, for these other issues. Well, thank you very much. I wish I had something positive to say about what we're doing in Oklahoma City, but I really don't. It, it's, it seems to be a, an increasing problem and a frustrating problem uh, in, in many ways. I think there's a great deal of, of sympathy around the, the plight that many of the people have, but yet there's a frustration in the inability for service providers to be successful in working with them. We have a very well thought out uh, homeless alliance and work, working with people. But again, at the, at the end of the day, it's about housing and the ability to get people into housing and also a lot of issues around mental health. So it's sort of a combination of things that we, we sort of know what the elements of the problem are, but we haven't seemed to be able to put together a cohesive strategy that is really working. And it seems as though, I don't know if it's because of substance abuse or, or what, or that, that there seem to be more. There seem to be more people that, and, and they, there seem to be less ability to, to make progress with them. So I can say, I wish we could be, knew what to do, but and maybe we just should take off a small bite at a time and try something. So that's probably the direction we'll try to go. The stories that we're hearing are all, all around the nation is that COVID has caused uh, fear um, uh, to uh, assemble in congregate uh, care settings. And so people are camping out more so that the issue, it's not that the issue is necessarily larger. It's been large for a long time. It's just that it's way more visible. Um, and so um, it's, it, it's, it's really in front of us now, and we do have to do something about it. There's no silver bullet, is there, Keith? Uh, no. In fact, that's, uh, that's part of the issue. There is no one uh, vaccine that's going to solve the, the homeless problem. Uh, we've looked at it, and we know there's basically, for the most part, uh, most of our homeless shelters and organizations are using HUD money to live on. And if you take that away, there's no way they survive. Uh, we also know that in our community, we're talking about mental health and substance abuse being two of the leading factors for homelessness. But yet most of our homeless shelters do not have a mental health expert or a substance abuse expert on staff. Um, so we've actually put forward with one of our uh, leading health uh, entities in town, a study. How do we have, you know, a seamless process from moving from homelessness to housing, but also addressing those factors that cause them to be homeless in the first place, whether it's workforce and they need training, whether it's substance abuse and they need addiction help, or whether it's mental health and they need some, some therapy. So how do you address those issues while they're working through the process? We, I, I agree with Nancy. We don't have all the answers, but we're at least conducting that study at this point to try to bring some cost savings, of course, in line. Uh, and how do we target then some of that future funding in some of those areas? So, you know, how do we partner with our mental health organizations to go into the homeless shelters and, and address this instead of taking them out of the shelters and hoping they get over to our mental health organizations, for instance? Same thing with substance abuse. So, yeah, it's, it's not an easy question, and it, I think it's going to be many, many, many pieces and parts put together, not one silver bullet, to use your expression. So as we, as we talk with homeless um, uh, advocates and housing uh, specialists throughout the, the nation, one of the things that, that comes to the fore is, is 
the idea that that uh, most people are homeless uh, have mental health issues is actually not factual. Uh, there is a subset, and a larger subset than in the general population with, with mental health uh, uh, issues. But the majority of people are just um, the, the, what we would call the working poor, people who have, been, um, who have been living on the edge and something transpired. Maybe it's COVID, maybe it's a, a, you know, uh, getting injured or whatever that throws them out of, of a housing circumstance. Um, and it's, it's, that's one of those things where we seem to have so many people living on an edge without a safety net and communities don't seem to be equipped um, to, to provide that, that safety net. Until we deal with that issue, we're never going to solve the, this, this uh, problem. Jenny, have you been able to in any way develop some solutions uh, down in Southern Arizona that we can learn from? Well, you know, I mean, I think there's a sort of special role for a community foundation in an issue like housing and homelessness, which is to be in for the long haul. You know, that it, there are these complex, seemingly intractable community issues that are, are vexing and that are not, as, as we've all pointed out, not easy to solve. But one role we can play is making sure they stay on the agenda and they stay on the table and we don't let them uh, kind of fade away when people's attention turns elsewhere. And also in some ways also do that kind of long work like the research that you talked about, Keith. Um, we also um, have uh, supported and incubated something called the MAP dashboard, which is a community indicators project here, uh, which, which definitely is taking a close look at housing. And we you know, continue to support that project and help to amplify the findings. And so having the MAP dashboard there in a position to kind of help to bring uh, data to this um, question that is then used by policymakers and businesses is something that we, we support and really appreciate. And we have, you know, kind of, um, we were talking before the call, you know, we've become a, a destination, you know, we have more, the most number of days of sunshine of any, uh, any metro area in, in America. So people are coming here when they're, de, you know, decoupled from having to live in a certain place to do their job. They can enjoy our weather <laughs> and our community and our art and our food. And so, uh, which is really lovely, but that means that those folks are coming in often from higher priced uh, housing markets, and that's really driving up the cost of housing, which our MAP dashboard is tracking. And that is putting a lot of the folks who are on that edge off. off I'd like to take that, that, that topic, Jenny, and I, mm -hmm. I'd love to get everyone's uh, take on this. You know, America has always been a, a market-priced society. Mm -hmm. right? And, and is, is part of the consequence of that and the fact that people are mobile and people who have more money can price markets out of reach for the people who have lived in places, is that part of what we're experiencing right now? Is that, is that an attendant cost? And is that sort of, oh, well, that's the way it is kind of thing? Or is, is there room in, in this country to ameliorate our, our past system of being purely market priced Without tipping into um, into uh, uh, you know a socialist kind of a kind of a an approach, but instead have an American approach where there's room within communities for that type of diversity, economic diversity, where people of different income levels um, who are also serving those communities, either you know in, as service workers or um, or uh, various um, uh, responding um, uh, uh, fields, uh, EMTs and so on, that they can afford to live within those communities themselves. Um, uh, Keith, and, and let's go over to, to Nancy then. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that kind of an idea? Yeah, I, I think you're, every region in America is going to be a little different. If, you, if you're talking Northwest Ohio, Toledo, our issue is not housing stock. Our issue is people who will take and live in some of the housing. So, um, you know, affordability is not the problem here. We don't even talk about livable wage now. We have, you know, we've been fortunate enough to add two Amazon facilities. Peloton's building their largest plant here, and we're looking for workers. So our issues around the housing question is how can we move someone who by uh, issues in their life now end up in a homeless situation. Can we get them into housing? And and many of those people coming back to your point don't even have the assets to move into a fifteen twenty thousand dollar home. So how do we help them? Uh, but take that to Jenny's point. We're not sunny 
every day of the year by any stretch of the imagination. So it's, I think it's a little bit depends on where you're at uh, in the nation. I, I can see, however, because of some of the great things happening downtown where we could suddenly outprice folks living in their neighborhood because some of the great development happening around them just frankly squeezes and pushing, which is an issue we're starting to have to talk about. Your, so your point isn't isn't a, the affordability issue. Your point is that there are other issues that are, that attach to this, and are there are there ways that we can respond as a community? Um, Correct. Uh, Nancy, I, I just want to mention, um, I, I, we had just completed one poll in which we asked whether people were aware of the issues. And I know that each of you uh, publish uh, different indicators of, of what the issues are in your communities. 84% said that they were uh, aware of, of the issues, but there's still 15% that are, that are less aware. And I guess part of your program are, is, is to make sure that people have a place to go to figure out uh, where they can invest in a community to address particular needs, right, Nancy? Right, and I think the I think the, the group that I'm most concerned about right now are not necessarily the people that are in the shelters because at least there is availability of services there. It's the people who won't go to the shelters and who basically are camping out around the community and camping out in places that be, that are creating a very a very negative feeling about in the community about homelessness. So that's the challenge is, is how do you not necessarily have everybody just get rid of them, put them in jail kind of reaction to them because of because of the situation that they've created, but yet get those people to be willing to accept the services. So but that's our big significant issue right now is trying to get people to accept services. We think that they're available, but we really do have a a pretty significant issue of, of, of people that literally are living on the street, camping out camp in, in areas that are just not appropriate for them to be, much less safe for them to be. And you have people become acclimated to a particular way of being and, and can be resistant about changing that. By the way, I got a, um, a, a question from Colleen Zimmerman, because um, we're going to segue now to the educational issue. Um, and Colleen asks, how, uh, can you share how universities can work with local community foundations for community needs, such as nursing shortages or, or healthcare workers or, or some of the employment issues that, that various um, uh, communities face? And we should also look at um, how schools can, uh, can work with community foundations to test out some of their programs. So uh, Nancy, since, we, since we're with you, let's, let's uh, stick with you. Could you talk a little bit about the various uh, programs that you have to advance education? Then we'll go um, around the, the room, uh, Keith and then Jenny. And if you could each talk a little bit about the programs that your investors are funding and the returns that they wish to, to see in terms of the impact on the very young to, uh, to older students. Um, not to, to avoid the question, but to, to go back to the COVID created a real crisis in education for, for just K through 12 education, as well as both preschool as and, and otherwise, in the sense that get, lots of kids were left without anything to do, or in all honesty, the virtual option did not work particularly well for them. And, and so we had some really some real declines in educational support here. So we've been actually working with some boys and girls clubs and similar kinds of community based programs to try to build back some of that educational loss, as well as just deal with the whole issue of children needing mentorship, needing opportunities to see other people and to have a positive place to go other than just the school and the home. And uh, it's, and that really is becoming an important issue for, for middle school and high school students who are really, who you really need to be thinking about what's your future, what do you really wanna do? And so I think, like I say, I think COVID, the COVID isolation did not help in that regard. So we're really trying to build back some community and some sense of positive uh, opportunity with a lot of kids that maybe kind of were for the last two years have kind of been on their own and with maybe not a whole lot of good things to think about. Are we going to keep able to turn, um, as, as Americans always have, um, adversity into advantage, um, having gone through this process of, of learning through COVID and, and the traumatization of, of of not being able to interact, particularly young kids, uh, but also adolescents not being able to interact. Are we going to 
be able coming out of this to add to our tool set, our educational tool set through these various mechanisms, these distance learning mechanisms, um, are we are going to be able to reduce costs of an education uh, so that it's more accessible to more people um, at the end of this COVID experience? Yeah, I, I don't want to turn myself into an economist, but I think there are pieces and parts of that. I mean, if for nothing else in our public education system here, COVID required them to upgrade technology across the board. And, uh, and, and like also, this, right? I mean, it was just yeah. like overnight. I, I, I know a lot of people. I mean, we were talking with uh, Randy Weingarten of the, of the American Federation of Teachers and a number of others. I mean, it was like, you know, in a week, we're going to hold all my classes. That's it. Yeah. So in our community, we had to suddenly for our students set up Wi-Fi. We had to give Chromebooks out that were used in classrooms only now to take home. Uh, so there was a huge upgrade technology wise. The university, frankly, helped in that degree uh, and they continue to help. I mean, our, we've tried to tie in uh, diversity and inclusion into this whole. How do we create how do we deal with some of these shortages that were spoken of? Uh, for instance, we have a shortage of teachers. So uh, we're sponsoring a program with our university to encourage teachers in our minority community, minority students to move teachers. Same thing with nursing. Uh, it was mentioned in the question. We have a university that we put a three-year program in to help them recruit minority students that will become nurses. Uh, so we try, I mean, we're trying to do two things at one time. Uh, uh, let's deal with uh, some of our shortages. The university can help us through it. That COVID has now pushed us to reality of, but let's also address some economic issues. Uh, that we can rise, help rise up some students and some some of our population to fill some of these shortages as well. One of the co commonalities here is that uh, students of color, young people of color, communities of color um, have generally suffered more during this um, this situation. Jenny, as 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 you see us out, because we're we're at the end of our time, could you just talk a little bit about how we correct? You know, the country needs all of its all of its people, all of its people, and to have generation after generation be disadvantaged and not be able to work their way out because of, of economic imbalances, where so much depends on your wealth, so much of your future, your child's education depends on on wealth. How do we, as as community foundations, um, try to support? the meritocracy that America is and ought to be. Um, how do we do that? Well, give me the small question. Thanks, Mark. Um, <laughs> um, well, you know, I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I think, you know, weaving equity into everything that we do um, is, is incredibly important and, and doing that representation in our communities, keep, as I said before, keeping that part of the conversation. Um, and obviously, in our grant making, uh, for example, our recent COVID grant making, uh, we did an analysis and we gave away uh, $3.78 million and 93% and of that went to organizations serving marginalized people. And, you know, we're very proud of that. That's something we wanted to make uh, important in our society. But to me, I think there is a kind of magic um, connection we can make between philanthropy, which obviously comes from people of all levels of means, but certainly in the larger dollars from people of greater means and, and the need that is there and helping to um, you know, create a dialogue and, and a genuine authentic conversation, which might involve some difficult conversations um, between uh, groups that are, are making change on the ground and, and philanthropists who might be interested in providing that support and, and kind of facilitating that dialogue and that discussion so that it's a natural discussion and one where people who have the means I recognize it as an important part of who they, their values, that they would express uh, those values through philanthropy in, in areas that really help to um, create more equity. So that, that's kind of a, a vision that I have of, of facilitating that dialogue and, and growing those conversations with, especially since we have a lot of wealth coming into our community, I want to help people feel like they're very comfortable and knowledgeable about giving where they live. And I think that one of the very special things about community foundations is the exchange of energy that that, that occurs. Mm -hmm. Who is giving, right? If somebody is is helping me to, to educate myself and improving my life, I am receiving. I am the receiver, mm -hmm. right? And, right. and 
if 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 we can in community uplift and figure out how to how to solve the community's problems, what is good for you is going to be good for me because I too am a member of a community. I, it's just wonderful to have you all here. Please thank your staffs, thank your boards, thank your investors, thank the people who are serving you and who you serve for your great work. Nancy Anthony, president of the Oklahoma City Community Foundation, Keith Burrell, president of the Toledo Community Foundation, Jenny Flynn, president and CEO of the Community Foundation for Southern Arizona. Thank you all for your lessons. Stay safe and, and really just keep up your wonderful, wonderful work to strengthen the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Take care.